Because we cannot see inside the sun, information about solar phenomena often must be obtained by studying events which occur outside the sun, but which are directly influenced by it. For example, the solar corona, a constantly changing pearly white halo which envelops the sun and extends in more or less definite rays or streamers. Since the corona is but one millionth as bright as the sun, it becomes fully visible only during a solar eclipse when the sun's disk is blocked by the moon. The exact nature of the corona is not known, but its constantly moving patterns reflect the sun's changing magnetic fields and violent activities. Also, the corona emits radiations which produce the aurora borealis and periodically interfere with radio transmissions on the Earth. Coronal illumination is believed to be sunlight scattered by free electrons in the region close to the sun and by interplanetary dust in the more distant areas. Some of our most interesting and least understood knowledge about the corona has been obtained by studying the spectrum of this scattered illumination. The inner corona shows a continuous spectrum of sunlight, while the outer corona reveals an absorption spectrum, the dark lines being caused by elements present on the sun's visible surface. Since each atom or molecule absorbs a certain wavelength, the elements can be identified from the positions of their absorption bands in the spectrum. The lines are present in the inner corona as well, but are obscured by the intense background illumination. The coronal spectrum also contains a series of bright emission lines, which are radiations emitted by highly charged ions of various atoms. These ions can exist only when energy levels are high enough to alter the normal atomic structure. For example, the normal atom of iron, identified as iron-1, has 26 electrons orbiting around its nucleus. If the energy level increases, an electron is displaced, and the atom becomes an ion identified as iron-2. If the energy increases further and a second electron displaced, the atom becomes iron-3 and so forth. These displaced electrons move freely in the space around the sun and help to scatter the solar radiation we see as the corona. For each state of ionization, an atom will emit radiations at characteristic wavelengths in the spectrum. For example, iron-14, which has 13 electrons displaced, produces a bright emission line at a wavelength of 5303 angstrom units. Since the energy required to produce an ion is known, we can determine the temperature where it exists. Ions reveal that temperatures of one million degrees Kelvin and higher occur in the corona, while the surface of the sun is only about 6,000 degrees. No full explanation has been found for this seeming incongruity. However, it would seem that coronal heating is mechanical in nature and probably results from pulses or shock waves of energy traveling from the surface of the sun. The atomic particles in the corona become ionized because of the mechanical energy imparted to them by these shock waves. Research into the mysteries of the sun is continuous, but it reaches periods of peak activity during each solar eclipse when the full corona can be observed and studied. In recent years, the Los Alamos Scientific Laboratory in New Mexico has become active in solar eclipse studies. Although Los Alamos is best known as a nuclear research laboratory and the birthplace of the atomic age, the techniques employed in nuclear development work can be equally useful in solar studies. For example, the basic mission of these NC-135 aircraft is to provide stable, high-altitude platforms from which precise measurements and observations can be made during nuclear research programs. Since the same qualities are desirable during solar observations, the aircraft are well suited for this work as well. Solar eclipse expeditions undertaken by Los Alamos in May 1965 and again in late 1966 are typical of the laboratory's research into solar phenomena. Preparations begin many months in advance for the three experiments Los Alamos scientists will conduct during the 1966 solar eclipse. The specialized and complex instruments to be used are designed and built at the laboratory. The largest is fondly referred to as the Rube Goldberg, partly no doubt because of its obvious complexity.
Basically, the Rube Goldberg is an 80-inch focal length telescope to which are mounted several instruments for measuring and analyzing coronal light. Near the lower end of the telescope, the main light path is divided by a mirror which reflects one half the coronal image to a photographic interferometer. The remaining part of the image is focused onto the ends of 36 fiber optic bundles which lead to a photometer and a photoelectric interferometer. The bundles of glass fibers act as flexible light pipes which transmit light focused on them. At the focal plane of the telescope, the fiber ends are arranged in a radial pattern so that each bundle samples light from a different point within the corona. Illumination from the light pipes is analyzed to determine different types of information. Thirty of the pipes go to the photometer, which measures the intensity of the light. This instrument is a joint effort of the Los Alamos and Sandia laboratories. Light from the fiber optic bundle passes through a collimating lens and a filter, which blocks all wavelengths except those emitted by the bright emission line of a certain ion. The intensity of the light is then measured by a photomultiplier tube or electric eye whose output is recorded on magnetic tape. The discs holding the light pipes and the filters can be rotated independently. Thus, by sampling light from different fiber optic bundles and by changing filters, the intensity of various emission lines can be measured at many positions within the corona. The photometer will measure the bright emission line intensity of iron-14, calcium-15, and iron-10. Shown graphically, the vertical scale represents the intensity of the spectrum, and the horizontal scale its wavelength in angstrom units. The gradually descending line is the background illumination in the corona, while the bright ion emissions appear as peaks. The filter in the photometer blocks the spectral light except at frequencies around the particular emission line being studied. The output of the photomultiplier tube then indicates the relative intensity of this emission line. The intensity of the other bright lines is measured simply by changing filters so that a different band of frequencies becomes visible. Intensity is also measured in the continuum regions adjacent to the lines in order to correct the measured emission line intensities for the background light. The six remaining fiber optic light pipes leading from the focal plane of the Rube Goldberg carry coronal illumination to the photoelectric interferometer. This instrument is similar to the photometer except that it determines the shape of the emission line rather than its intensity. Again, light from the bundle passes through a collimating lens and a filter. But then it must pass through an interferometer before reaching the photomultiplier. The interferometer further narrows the wavelengths being measured by passing only a very small band of the light it receives. It can be adjusted to vary the frequency of light it passes. The photoelectric interferometer will determine the shape of iron-14 and iron-10 emission lines. As before, the color filter serves to block all wavelengths except a relatively narrow band around the emission line. The interferometer then narrows the band of transmitted light even further. Since the particular band passed by the interferometer is variable, intensity can be measured at different discrete frequencies within the bright emission line. The plot of these intensity levels describes the shape of the emission line, which is important since the shape reflects the motions of the individual ions in the corona and therefore the temperature. The corona is viewed rather than just selected points, and the image is recorded. In addition to the diagnostic instruments that have been described, the Rube Goldberg is also equipped with a 16 millimeter motion picture camera which monitors operation of the system and a photo tracker which keeps the telescope accurately aimed. These units view the corona by means of a beam-splitting mirror which reflects 10% of the light from the main optical path. The data gathered by the Rube Goldberg will tell scientists more about the temperature of the corona and about the abundance of certain elements that comprise it. Another of the special eclipse instruments is the coronal camera. 
Here, the shutter is being checked to measure the precise amount of light transmitted at various operating speeds. The camera uses a 36-inch focal length lens to photograph the corona out to a distance of at least five solar radii from the surface of the sun. Exposures are made through a broad band orange filter in three planes of polarization. The photographs resulting from this experiment will enable scientists to learn more about the electron density of the corona and about the structure of coronal streamers. The third special instrument is the emission line camera, which is equipped with nine separate 13-inch focal length lenses. Eight of these focus images of the corona on a single piece of film, while the ninth supplies an image to a stabilization and tracking system. The eight lenses used for photography are equipped with narrow band filters, each of which passes only the wavelengths of a particular ion or region of the solar spectrum. The camera will record the emission lines of nickel-13, iron-14, calcium-15, iron-10, nickel-15, and three regions of the continuous spectrum near these lines. The images will provide a photographic map of the intensity and distribution of these ions from which scientists hope to determine the varying temperatures throughout the corona. The photo tracker for the emission line camera is the same as those used on the Rube Goldberg and the coronal camera. An image of the object being studied, in this case the sun, is focused on a ground glass plate where it can be observed by the operator. Within the plate are embedded four pairs of fiber optic bundles which carry the illumination focused on them to light sensing photomultipliers. The photo tracker detects errors in the position of the image as small as 10 seconds of arc and sends signals to the stabilization system to keep the instrument precisely aimed at the corona. The normally spacious interior of the NC-135 research aircraft is nearly filled by the equipment that will be carried during the solar eclipse expedition. Starting at the forward section of the cabin, the aircraft carries the coronal camera and the command and timing stations from which the mission will be coordinated. Next are electronic data recording stations and two large DRC cosmic ray detectors installed by the Lawrence Radiation Laboratory. Immediately aft are the emission line camera, a gamma ray detector, and more data recording and control stations. The tail section houses the Rube Goldberg and additional cosmic ray measuring equipment, including a unit installed by the Douglas Aircraft Company. The stinger-like appendage on the tail holds a magnetometer for measuring the Earth's magnetic fields. An important consideration in the design of the coronal camera seen here and the other instruments was that even while being carried in a moving airplane and subject to a variety of unpredictable movements, they will have to track the image of the corona in space with great accuracy. To satisfy this rather challenging requirement, each instrument is equipped with three hydraulically operated aiming and stabilizing systems. The first is a manual system which is used to aim the instrument with enough accuracy so that the automatic stabilizing units can take control. A three-axis gyro system similar to an autopilot then takes over and corrects the position of the instrument as necessary to compensate for movements of the aircraft. The final system is the photo tracker which has been described. The stabilization system is accurate enough that exposures as long as 30 seconds can be made without noticeable degradation of image quality. Since solar eclipses occur at irregular intervals and can be observed only from very limited areas on the Earth's surface, scientists often must travel great distances to observe them. The 1966 eclipse will occur on November 12th and its path of totality will move across the Atlantic Ocean off the coast of South America. On November 3rd, 1966, Air Force 369, the aircraft instrumented by Los Alamos, leaves its home station at Kirtland Air Force Base, New Mexico, for the long flight to Buenos Aires, Argentina.
Two similar aircraft instrumented by the Sandia Laboratory and the Lawrence Radiation Laboratory are also participating in the eclipse study. In addition, both the National Aeronautics and Space Administration and the Air Force Cambridge Laboratory are flying aircraft on this eclipse. Since the long journey to Argentina and back covers a wide range of latitudes both north and south of the equator, the flights provide an excellent opportunity for measuring cosmic ray intensity and magnetic fields at high altitude over a broad range of the Earth's surface. Since it can fly well over 30,000 feet above sea level, the NC-135 provides an ideal vantage point for studying solar phenomena. At this altitude, observers are well above most of the distorting mechanisms, such as haze, dust, and clouds, which occur in the Earth's atmosphere. Another obvious advantage of such an airborne observatory is that it can readily go to the site of the phenomena to be observed. On November 5th, the NC-135s arrive at Buenos Aires, where the nuclear scientists join several hundred researchers from the United States and other countries who have journeyed to South America to study the eclipse. Several other Los Alamos scientists have arrived at Rio Grande, Brazil, some 400 miles east of Buenos Aires, where they prepare to conduct another solar eclipse research project. In this experiment, instrument packages designed to measure X-ray emissions from the sun's corona will be rocketed 250 kilometers above the Earth's surface. Each of the instrumentation units contains eight crystal spectrometers to measure X-rays emitted by highly ionized carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen atoms. The packages are equipped with sun-sensing units which keep them correctly oriented with the sun during flight. Three identical units will be launched at different times so that comparative measurements can be made of radiations from the clear sun and during the partial and full phases of the eclipse. The data obtained by the instruments will be relayed back to the ground by means of a radio telemetry data link. Los Alamos scientists work jointly with personnel from the Sandia laboratory who are responsible for the Nike Tomahawk rockets which carry the instruments. The five days following their arrival in Argentina are busy ones for the airborne Los Alamos personnel and their Air Force crews. The scientists spend long hours on the ground and during practice flights adjusting and calibrating their sensitive equipment. The long practice flights allow the scientists and Air Force flight crews to check out the procedures and navigation plan that will be followed during the eclipse flight. The mission plan calls for the NC-135 to establish an elliptical holding pattern off the South American coast at an altitude of 32,500 feet. At a predetermined time, the aircraft will leave the holding pattern and follow a track that will precisely correspond with the path of the eclipse. The shadow of totality, moving eastward approximately three times the speed of the NC-135, will catch up with, cover, and then move ahead of the aircraft. Since the airborne observers are moving with the shadow, they will see the full eclipse for about three minutes, while observers on the ground will see it for only two minutes. During all practice flights and the Eclipse mission, the Los Alamos aircraft carries three Argentine scientists who conduct their own cosmic ray experiment. By providing this service, the Americans are able, in a small way at least, to show their appreciation for the excellent support and cooperation they are receiving from the Argentine government. Finally, after the months of preparation and practice, it is November 12th, 1966, the day of the eclipse.
Air Force 371, the aircraft instrumented by the Lawrence Radiation Laboratory, leaves Buenos Aires shortly after dawn to scout weather conditions along the proposed flight path. The remaining crews and aircraft stand by until their scheduled times for takeoff. If visibility is poor in the planned area, the three aircraft will fly an alternate course to find improved conditions for viewing the eclipse. By the time the Air Force and scientific crews have boarded their aircraft, word has been received from the airborne Livermore plane that weather conditions and visibility are excellent in the eclipse area. A short time later, all three flying observatories circle in the holding pattern from which they will set out to chase the sun shadow. All right, now we're breaking out in the clear. Uh, a little thin surface of dirt. I think we should try to climb until we make our turn in there. Okay, and uh, to turn in there, if, if we could, I'd like to descend to get ground speed. Well, I think that uh, there may be something about that surface for me. I don't know where, it, it looks awful clear out ahead now. As the aircraft fly in the holding pattern, scientists make final preparations to ready their equipment for its brief look at the corona. The magnetic tape units, which record data from all the cosmic ray and coronal instruments, are installed in duplicate to ensure that information will be obtained even if part of the recording equipment should fail. Each half of the double system records 50 channels of information. Okay, we're coming up on the heading for the eclipse run. The heading will be 137. The scientific commander observes the progress of the eclipse and checks the position of the sun in relation to the aircraft by means of an ingeniously simple sun compass, which uses a fixed lens to focus the sun's image on a chart. Approach of the total eclipse is heralded by the eerie half-light of the gathering midday dusk as the moon gradually moves between the sun and the observers. Uh, position it aft a little bit, Paul. Have you found it yet? Uh, I got the fore and aft just where I left it, so I think I'll leave it there. Okay. That image is bright enough, I just as soon keep it off the fibers a little while. Okay. Well, sure, should I cut the high voltage? No, you're all right. I got the uh, upper limb covered and the right limb covered. Okay. Pictures will be started at 1610. 1610. Okay, remove the ND and put in the 1.5 aperture. Lamp gyro. Okay, we're set. Okay. I'll pull it off at exactly zero, huh, Tom? I can see the uh, corona on the other side of the sun. And I'll put it onto the fibers now and try to photo track. I can photo track in L. I can photo track in T. You cannot or you can? I can. Minus 30. All right, I'm in photo track on two axes. Oh, it's drifting away. I'll I'm not surprised. Job. All right. All right, I'm in uh, T, L axis. Photo track and T axis gyro. That's the way it should be. There's no light for the T-axis. Yeah, 20 seconds, filter four. All right. Uh, don't start until I'm here. Come on, you go ahead, Luz. Yeah, I did. Okay, you completed that? Yeah. Don't forget your ramp when it's time. All right. 28, the exposure will end. Okay, the uh, prominences in the northwest. 20 is seconds, filter two. Brilliant in green coronal light. Aha, it's the Venus. Yes, Venus is uh, approximately five, uh, no, 10 degrees, no, five degrees. 20 seconds, filter one. From its uh, position. Filter number three. Three and frame 28. Give me 2.8. 2.8. Excellent tracking. Filter number one. One in. Still good tracking. 20 seconds, filter three. Green two. 
One of those prominences is just at 45 degrees, and it will hit the fibers nicely. Green three. 20 seconds, filter two. I'm still in two axis, uh, Stop. Go ahead. Three. Uh, Stop. You are reversed, and I'm pulling the um, polarizer. Polarizer is pulled. Green three. three. You're yeah. reversed, Matt. Go ahead and start it. Ten seconds, filter three. Coming All right. Up. We're going unstable. I've uh, gone into gyro track. No. All right. You're past third contact. When We're you're past uh, third contact. I'll move the uh, sun uh, out of the uh, uh, fibers. Uh, what was the time of totality? Uh, it was just about three minutes. Totalized. After approximately three minutes of totality, the full eclipse ends as suddenly as it began. With the most critical part of the mission completed, the crew members relax momentarily as the NC-135 begins its return flight to Buenos Aires. However, before the aircraft returns to the United States, it will fly several more cosmic ray study missions that will carry the scientists far to the south, almost to the Antarctic continent. The photographic films and magnetic tapes recorded during the eclipse are removed from the aircraft for careful storage until they can be carried back to Los Alamos to be processed and studied. The solar eclipse expedition produced an abundance of raw data about the solar corona and hence about the nature of the sun itself. The films exposed by the emission line camera show graphically the distribution and intensity of various ion forms within the corona. The coronal camera recorded more than 40 images at various exposure times. In the longer exposures, the coronal rays and streamers are visible out to a distance of about six solar radii from the surface of the sun. Full interpretation of these photographic records and the electronic data from the Rube Goldberg recorded on magnetic tape will require many months of detailed study and analysis. The knowledge thus obtained will help man to better understand the secrets of the sun and the influence of solar phenomena in space and on the earth. In large part, the skills and equipment used by the Los Alamos scientists during the Eclipse expedition were originally developed for highly specialized nuclear research. For example, the sophisticated optical and electronic data recording systems are closely related to the diagnostic equipment employed during the testing of nuclear weapons. And the NC-135 aircraft, which proved so useful as flying observatories, have as their primary mission an important role in the atomic energy development programs of the United States. Participation in programs such as the Solar Eclipse Expedition provides an opportunity for Los Alamos scientists to maintain and increase proficiency in their specialized skills, and at the same time permits the techniques of a unique scientific discipline to be used to increase man's general knowledge about his environment.